All right. Good evening, everybody. It's uh, 8 p.m. Eastern uh, Daylight Time. Thank you very much for uh, joining us for the Miller Review OrthoBullet Sports Medicine webinar. My name is Steve Thompson. I'm one of the co-coordinators uh, of uh, the virtual uh, curriculum. Today, uh, we'll be discussing uh, the very first of our webinars and going through the sports uh, specialty specific examination that you all had an opportunity to discuss, or I'm sorry, to uh, go through. It's uh, my great pleasure today to introduce our esteemed faculty. Um, I'll first uh, begin with some introductions. Then Derek Moore will discuss briefly the virtual curriculum. We'll discuss, uh, then uh, Mark will talk about the first part of the sports talk. And uh, Pat McCullough will then bring in the second part. Uh, we'll have in the chat room uh, Michael Hughes and Charlie Jobin. And then we'll end with some closing remarks. I hope to be prompt and on time, and I hope to get you all back into bed by uh, 10 p.m. Eastern. So Mark uh, is our first uh, speaker. He really needs no introduction. He's from the University of Virginia. He's the esteemed professor of orthopedic surgery and team physician of the James Madison University. He's the deputy JBJS editor for sports medicine and the director and founder of the Miller Review course. He's also the editor of the uh, premier review book in orthopedics, Review of Orthopedics, and um, is a well-renowned, world-famous orthopedic surgeon, voted in the top 70 of best knee surgeons in America. Todd McCullough is joining us uh, today. Uh, he is the assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Will Cornell Medical College. He's a staff surgeon at the, the Methodist Hospital in Texas Medical Center, where he practices uh, sports medicine. We have in the uh, chat room today, Michael Hughes, who's a sports fellow, and Charlie Jobin, who's a shoulder and elbow fellow, both who are currently fellows at the uh, Department of Orthopedics at Washington University in St. Louis. Both these uh, fine surgeons have been uh, instrumental in uh, helping establish uh, orthobullets.com. Speaking of orthobullets, we have in the room immediately to my uh, side, Derek Moore. Derek is the uh, founder of uh, OrthoBullets. He's a spine surgeon in private practice uh, in Dartmouth, and he's also a uh, faculty member at the Miller Review course, which many of you will be attending that we look forward to seeing you in a few short weeks in Colorado. My name is Steve Thompson. I'm a clinical fellow at uh, Fowler Kennedy in London, Ontario, Canada. I took both the American and Canadian boards. Uh, I'm the uh, assistant editor in chief of uh, the Miller Review of orthopedics, which Mark was very kind enough to uh, have me help him out with. I'm the uh, person who you, many of you have uh, talked about or talked with uh, in trying to get into this. And I'm also the uh, on faculty at the Miller Review course. So without uh, further ado, we'll bring in Derek. And Derek is gonna talk a little bit about uh, the ortho bullets and uh, the vector learning technique, Derek. Yeah, uh, thanks, Stephen. So uh, I just want to say hi to everybody. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank all the OrthoBullets authors. Uh, OrthoBullets has been a big project, and uh, it's definitely been a team effort. Uh, in terms of all the PGY5 residents out there, congratulations. Uh, you're almost done. Uh, you do have two major hurdles to jump over. There's the ABOS Part 1 and ABOS Part 2. Uh, you know, after that, life does get much better, so you definitely have something to look forward to. Um, so, you know, this test is a very stressful test, uh, a lot weighs on it, uh, but I just want you guys to know, everybody out there, it doesn't matter if you got 6% on your OIT, all of you can pass this test. Uh, my philosophy on this test is that it's a different skill set than being a good doctor, and you just have to learn those skills to repair, uh, so it's kind of like running a marathon. You train for a marathon by running long distance, you don't swim. Uh, so we really designed this you know, virtual curriculum around giving you the skills that you need to pass this test. Those skills are you know, test endurance, uh, you know, being able to sit through this and test, so that's why we have lots of uh, you know, practice examinations that you should take. And then there's this technique that we call the vector learning technique. Uh, we know that memorization is really based on repetition. So when we develop this technique and these, you know, these examinations, the idea is that you're going to see the same questions, the same content over and over again. 
And the feeling that you really feel is how you felt in organic chemistry when you were looking at flashcards over and over and over again. And I know it's kind of monotonous. It's not enjoyable. We would all rather be reading an interesting article. But, you know, at least I believe that it is the best way to prepare for this exam. So when you see questions for the third, fourth, fifth time, slides for the third, fourth, fifth time, uh, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. And I really encourage you to go through those tests using that vector technique. It's, it's monotonous, it's boring, but if you see this stuff over and over again, you'll memorize it, and when you see it on the test, you'll recognize it, and uh, you'll get that question right. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Uh, you know, it's been great to team up with Mark. You know, I definitely believe that, you know, education, there's going to be a virtual component in the future, but there's just nothing that can replace a good lecture. So we're excited to team up with him with his uh, actual course. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mark, and we'll go from there. Mark, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's uh, no audio coming through on your uh, side yet. Okay, let's try that again. So, uh, Derek, thanks very much. And, uh, we certainly appreciate partnering with you and uh, partnering with your esteemed faculty that you've assembled for Ortho Bullets, uh, and it's been a pleasure. Uh, we uh, also have been recognized and appreciate the talents of these young people like Steve Thompson with us tonight. And so. Uh, and Patrick Moore, uh, who will uh, Patrick, who will help us uh, with with the uh, Ortho Bullets uh, second half of this. Uh, and so, without further ado, we want to go into these test questions. Uh, I hope you've taken the time to review these questions because that's an essential part of preparing for this examination. And I felt it was appropriate to start with sports because that's what I do. Now, please recognize this book, Review of Orthopedics, sixth edition perhaps the most revised book in the history of orthopedics, if not all of medicine, is due out within one month. So look for it. So let's start with the top uh, topic, which is ACLs. We told you last uh, webinar two weeks ago that ACL was the top uh, section, and we have several questions tonight that deal with ACL. So without further ado, the first question involves uh, a collegiate uh, basketball player with a previous ACL with a re-injury, and the question is, what is the etiology of this injury? What is the most common cause of graft failure following ACL reconstruction? And clearly, that is malpositioning of the tunnel. The same slide appeared two weeks ago in our talk, and indeed, tunnel malposition is the most common cause of failure, uh, and there's a lot of problems with that, and uh, it's important nowadays, essentially, to try to get into an anatomic ACL reconstruction and try to uh, place your tunnel in the anatomical location. If your femoral tunnel is too anterior, you're loose in extension and tight in flexion. This diagram shows that very clearly. Uh, and if you look at this diagram and see where this tunnel is here, in extension it's loose, and in flexion uh, it is tight. And so that's a key concept that will be asked again. If your tunnel is too posterior, you have the opposite problem, and you have the potential for blowout. blowout. In the coronal plane, if your tunnel is too uh, vertical, you have a rotational problem, and we're recognizing that increasingly now uh, with our revision ACLs. The tibial tunnel, you can think similar ways. Uh, also recognize you can have notch impingement if it's too anterior, and if it's too posterior, you can have uh, impingement upon the posterior cruciate ligament. So that pretty well covers the first question, uh, and we'll uh, review the answer, which of course was number five, surgical error in tunnel position. The next question also on ACL. During ACL reconstruction, a graft that's tight in flexion but lack, lacks an extension may be due to its technical error. Now, if you missed this question, you really weren't listening the last couple of minutes because we just went through this, and that is, if the tunnel on the femoral side is too anterior, you're loose in extension and tight in flexion. If you're too posterior, you have the opposite problem. And so we've been over this slide, but recognize and memorize this graphic, because as they say, a picture tells a thousand words, and here's the problem 
with the tunnel to anterior, uh, you're too tight in flexion. So again, the answer here is number two. Uh, again, we have another ACL, and you'll probably get tired of ACLs, but that's the whole purpose is to really bone up on the essential stuff that's asked the most common. And again, female athlete ACLs uh, is a, certainly a problem uh, in, uh, in the current uh, sports medicine world, and that's uh, multifactorial in etiology, but there's one factor that contributes the most significantly, and it's also the same factor that has to do with ACL injury prevention. So if we think about that, we'll discuss that in the next slide. And here we are. Uh, the bottom line is an ACL, of course, a non-contact pivoting injury with immediate hemarthrosis. It's very common in female athletes, three to five times more common than males. And the prevention focuses on improving biomechanics, neuromuscular physical therapy. So here's the point. Instead of landing in extension and valgus as female athletes are prone to do, they need to be instructed in landing in more flexion and jump landing, jump training, plyometrics, uh, and neuromuscular physical therapy uh, can be very, very helpful in preventing ACL tears. Now recognize also that ACL tears are highly associated with lateral meniscus tears, which in general are less common than medial meniscus tears in the entire population. But with an acute ACL tear, the lateral meniscus tear is most common. Recognize also the exam. The Lachman is the key exam for ACL. Pivot shift is very helpful for confirmatory tests and it will allow us to test for rotational instability. Difficult to do in, in clinic. Also recognize that with ACLs you can have a quadriceps avoidance gait, uh, which is commonly asked question as well. So back to the focus of this question, we want to focus on female athletes, jump training, landing training, neuromuscular, physical therapy. Therefore, the answer is number three, neuromuscular coordination and training. Next question, another ACL question. And we're hammering this home because it's so important on the test. In biomechanical testing, which of the following ACL graphs has the highest maximum load to failure? Lots of studies have been done on this in lots of different cadaver specimens. However, in general, the clear answer is that the hamstring grafts are the strongest graft. Uh, this uh, series of studies summarized here recognize the hamstring about 2400 uh, newtons as opposed to the um, patella tendon, which is uh, somewhere between 1800 and 2300 newtons, uh, and the quadriceps tendon, which lies in between them. So um, the native ACL is about 2,200 newtons. So the hamstring graft, at least in this study, is stronger than this. And in other studies, much more stronger. But without question, the universal answer in all studies is that the hamstring, the quadrupled hamstring graft, is the strongest graft. The issue may be with fixation, but as far as the graft itself, the hamstring graft is the strongest of these graphs that are available. Therefore, the question, quadrupled semitendinosus and gracilis graft, stronger than any of these other options that are available on this question. Another ACL uh, question, uh, and here we have to do with rehab. We emphasized this two weeks ago about the importance of avoiding open chain exercises near full extension and the early rehab of ACL reconstructions. And therefore, the question is, at what range of motion do seated leg extension exercises, open chain exercises, place the greatest amount of stress on the ACL? Well, I think it's pretty clear what that is. Because open chain exercises uh, can uh, cause problems with a lot of stress in the ACL early in the ACL rehab, uh, and therefore they should be avoided. Open chain, there's nothing resisting the foot. Closed chain, there's something opposing the foot. Here's an open chain exercise right here. This is a no-no early on in rehab. 
And therefore, the question answer, not surprisingly, is number one, avoid open chain exercises 0 to 30 degrees early on in rehab. And then perhaps the last question in ACL, uh, when comparing autologous graft options for ACL, a hamstring have which of the following findings compared to patellar tendon grafts. Lots of studies about this in the literature, and clearly there's only one finding that is consistent in all of these studies. That is that anterior knee pain is more common with patellar tendon grafts. And therefore, uh, that's a consideration when you're doing patellar tendon grafts. And if patients have a history of anterior knee pain, pain with squatting, patellofemoral syndrome, they probably would be a better candidate for a different kind of graft. Reviewing the grafts again, the hamstring is the strongest. The uh, issue is that they can have knee flexion deficits, but it's only in terminal flexion. Size matters. We've seen some recent studies that size matters. Quadriceps a very strong graft. Allograft, increasingly you're noticing there's increased failures in young active patients. I would encourage you to look at AAOS now, the current edition. We went through all these graft choices in detail and summarized this in that edition uh, from the specialty day at the Arthroscopy Association. So the answer once again, graft choices, the problem with hamstring grafts is they do not have an increased incidence of anterior knee pain and therefore the answer is number three, hamstrings have less knee pain than patella tendons. And so then we're actually on to one final ACL question. A girls basketball player has a non-contact pivoting injury as an acute hemarthrosis. Dale Daniels studied this uh, several years ago uh, and uh, his uh, uh, mentee uh, uh, Donald Fithian studied it as well in the Kaiser system in Southern California. And they studied and found that 70% of people that showed up to their emergency room with a, a fusion in their knee and a history similar to this had an ACL tear, 70%. So that's an important number to keep in mind. The other number to keep in mind that is almost a quarter of OITE sports questions and a similar number of board sports questions involve the ACL. So study this topic if you're going to study anything else. Again, the quadriceps avoidance gate, the Lachman, the pivot shift, uh, all of these are important concepts that are tested for ACLs. So thankfully, I think we're on to beyond the ACL after this answer, which was greater than 60% because 70% from the Dale Daniels study was the correct answer. And now we're going to move on to another topic. Uh, not quite. Uh, we have one more topic, and that is the MRI pattern. Okay, so the, this is a ACL injury based upon the history. And the question is, which uh, pattern of these MRIs is associated with an ACL tear? Here you have a lesion on the um, lateral femoral condyle, the middle third, and the posterior lateral aspect of the tibia. Ring any bells? Here we have an anterior tibia injury associated with a hyperextension injury. Here we have a classic patellar dislocation injury with a coup and contra coup injury. Here we have another uh, hyperextension injury, and here a injury isolated simply to the very far posterior aspect of the tibia. So the question is, which of these is associated with an ACL tear? Clearly, it is this. That is the posterior aspect uh, of the tibia on the lateral side uh, and the middle third uh, of the femur. This is the classic pattern described and characterized uh, by the institution that our moderator is from, that is the Fowler Sports Medicine Center, uh, and they've done follow-up work on this bone bruise pattern. And uh, also Darren Johnson, my co-fellow from uh, Pittsburgh, who's now at Kentucky, did biopsies of these lesions and found dead cartilage. And so the significance of these injuries cannot be overlooked 
Uh, this is a potentially devastating problem associated with this bone bruise pattern. This is a sine qua non of an ACL tear and occurs very commonly perhaps as much as three quarters uh, of ACL tears. And interestingly it occurs because of this pattern. There's a momentary dislocation of the knee that occurs uh, when you have an ACL tear. It's rare to get this radiograph, but that's what happens. And so here you see the answer is number one, classic bone bruise pattern associated with an ACL tear. Thankfully, we're done with the ACL tears for now. But they'll come back because they're a quarter of the questions. So let's go on to the rotator cuff tear. Uh, Derek Moore has been nice enough to assemble these graphs for us and they show the importance of these topics. Uh, rotator cuffs number two. So here we go with rotator cuffs. The lift-off test evaluates internal rotation of the shoulder with the hand held behind the back. What muscle does this test? And this lift-off test has been well described. I believe it was first described by Christian Gerber. Uh, and here we see it here in this example. Uh, we see the man lifting his back off, arm off the back. If he can't do that, or if he has minimal strength when he does that, that suggests that he has a subscap tear. And the other issues with a subscap tear is they can have a belly press test, which is a similar test, sometimes called the Napoleon sign from the front. And also they have excessive external rotation. All of those signs are significant for subscap tears. Here's an arthroscopic image of a subscap repair done uh, arthroscopically. So the subscap, the lift-off test, the uh, importance of the subscap with uh, shoulder surgery, with open shoulder surgery, uh, also uh, with uh, uh, total shoulder arthroplasty, uh, I guarantee this will be on your exam because there's so many different ways they can ask this question. So know the subscap, know the significance of this test, know the other tests, uh, and know uh, that this can be a common complication following open shoulder surgery. Reviewing the question again, the answer is number one, lift off test, subscap, easy. Move on. Number nine, which of the following patients is a candidate, an optimal candidate, for a lat transfer? Well, lat tan transfers are a salvage procedure for massive rotator cuff tears. When you have a massive rotator cuff tear, uh, that is a tear greater than 5 centimeter involving uh, more than uh, one tendon and in fact irreparable, that is with fatty atrophy, retraction beyond the glenoid and simply not possibly to mobilize if they're chronic injuries especially, then you're in a dilemma and you're in a salvage dilemma. And the only thing you can do for that is one of two things, a tendon transfer or a reverse arthroplasty. Uh, well, three things. You could also do a hemiarthroplasty. You can never do a total shoulder arthroplasty, uh, but you certainly, uh, in a younger patient, dominant arm, in a laborer, young patient, you consider a tendon transfer. And uh, Gerber and J.P. Warner have uh, described this, uh, where you put a latissimus transfer uh, into, uh, replace the rotator cuff. It's a very arduous operation, but in the right indications, uh, has some indications. So again, young patient, active laborer, a massive, irreparable cuff tear. The answer is latissimus transfer. So we'll move on. Rotator cuff tears are seen on MRI and ultrasound and what patients, uh, for percentage of patients over 60 years old. In other words, asymptomatic patients. Uh, how often do you see uh, uh, a rotator cuff tear? There's been studies uh, in asymptomatic patients and cadavers and uh, we, we uh, uh, recognize uh, that these injuries occur in one study 30, another study 55% of patients in an asymptomatic patient over 60. Now, this seems like a huge number, and it is indeed. But you have to recognize half of these tears are partial tears, and half are full thickness tears. So all comers, uh, 30 to 55%, full thickness tears, half of that. 
and you know the numbers uh, go down accordingly. Um, uh, small, you know, small tears probably make up a good portion of that. But nevertheless, this is the number of this question. This is the number you recognize. I doubt if they're going to ask the details of that, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Now, let's review rotator cuff tears. Uh, they have a history of night pain. Uh, they uh, have uh, uh, impingement, weakness, uh, and uh, MRI can show the muscle quality uh, and retraction. The Goutelier, uh, uh scheme allows us to quantify uh, the amount of uh, muscle atrophy uh, in the supraspinatus, and you see that on the Y view on the MRI. Uh, and if you have massive retraction, massive fatty atrophy, the so-called uh, uh, olive and the martini, you've got a bad problem and you probably need to have a salvage procedure. So back to the original question, asymptomatic patients, uh, they can have uh, rotator cuff tear uh, in 30 to 55 percent of the time, half of those full thickness, half of those partial thickness. Let's move on to the next question. Just so happened my arrow happened to be in the right place. And the question is, what is the average medial lateral distance of the supraspinatus tendon insertion? So we know the supraspinatus insertion is about three centimeters uh, as far as from uh, uh, anterior to posterior uh, because that's the definition of a, a large tear. Uh, but the question is medial lateral. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because we're no, we want to know uh, whether or not to repair that tendon. And most people would say that you should repair that tendon if you have more than a 50% tear in the tendon. And therefore, you actually can measure that. Uh, and it's important to know that that measurement uh, from lateral to medial for the supraspinatus tendon is about 15 millimeters. And therefore, if you have a tendon tear that you measure and you have a footprint exposed that is more than seven or eight millimeters, you ought to consider either doing a repair through the tendon or take it down and repair that tendon. Uh, and so that's the current thinking in rotator cuff tears. And that's why this question exists about the width of the tendon. Therefore, the answer, 14 to 16 millimeters. So let's move on from rotator cuff to tubs. Now, TUBS is an interesting uh, acronym coined by uh, Matson. TUBS means traumatic unidirectional with a bank heart that needs surgery. And AMBRI, on the other hand, is atraumatic multidirectional bilateral rehab, 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 and then inferior capsular shift, or nowadays capsulorophy. Uh, so you should review that topic if you're not familiar with that nomenclature. So 25-year-old basketball player has a shoulder dislocation. MRI is most likely to show question mark. So acute traumatic shoulder dislocation, young patient, what are you going to have? You're going to have a labral tear. So a labral tear or bank art lesion is very, very common in young patients. And that is why the recurrence rate is so dependent upon the age of the patient. Young patients, as the West Point study has shown us, less than 20 years old uh, may have up to 80 or 90 percent redislocation rate. So that's the number one lesion, the bank heart tear, where it tears off the front, a soft tissue bank heart tear. You can also have a bony bank heart tear. You can have a hill sax lesion. You can even have a tear off of the humerus, the so-called haggle lesion. We'll discuss later. But the number one problem is the bank art tear. And this occurs in young patients. In older patients, over in 40, you don't really care as much about this. You're more concerned about the possibility of a rotator cuff tear. And this occur question occurs all the time. So equal proportion of questions. Labral tears, young patient. Cuff tears, older patients. Now, I hesitate to say that they're that old if they're over 40, but that's what the test says. So recognize those issues. Recognize also this transient neuropraxia, especially the axillary nerve uh, in older patients as well. So back to the original question. Young patient, shoulder dislocation. The answer here, 
is without question anterior inferior labral tear, aka bank heart or Perthes lesion. Moving on, another shoulder instability question, and this has to do with what I call alphabet soup. Alphabet soup is all of the nicknames we've given to all these shoulder problems. Alpsa, uh, Haggle, um, etc. Uh, and so here we have a question about a patient who dislocates his shoulder. MRI is shown below. Had a bank card repair and it didn't work. Well, why didn't it work? Well, the question is they must have missed something. Whenever something doesn't work, you have to think about the fact that something was missed. And in this case, uh, a haggle lesion was missed. And so we'll discuss this, the haggle humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, hence the alphabet soup. And here we see on a classic OITE uh, picture that appeared at least twice in sub subsequent OITEs, and is a classic picture, one of the best pictures I've ever seen of this problem, is a humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. Look at this. The labrum's intact, but off of the humerus, off of the, the uh, neck of the humerus, is the capsular injury. And so that shouldn't be missed. And I'm sure this is something that's seen me more than I've seen it. And I think that most honest shoulder surgeons would tell you the same thing. We're starting to recognize it more often. If you see muscle fibers when you're doing a shoulder scope, that's something wrong there. And you think about it, put your thinking cap on, uh, because that may signify that you had a haggle lesion. And haggle lesions, which only occur about 2% of the time, seem to occur a hell of a lot more than that on examinations. And therefore, you should recognize that, recognize the recurrent instability associated with this. I like to make an analogy uh, of a uh, tightly made bed. If you tuck your sheets in and make your bed tight, uh, your, your bed will be nice and crisp uh, and not unstable. However, if you fail to tuck the sheets in at the base, then it's not going to work. It's the same thing with shrinkage. If you have a bank card or a haggle on one lesion uh, and you have a um, shrinkage procedure and tighten up the sheets without tucking them in first, your bed's going to be loose. So think about that. Either way, you've got to fix both sides of the sheets. And so the answer here, number three, haggle. Know that. Don't miss it. And more importantly, out in practice, look for it. Next question. We have a patient uh, who has uh, an MRI. And he had, uh, the question is, where is the trauma that occurred? So you have to ask yourself, what size the lesion? So if you ever have a question, uh, you look for the subscap. You look for the coracoid, which is about to come into view here. Uh, you look and you realize this is anterior, this is posterior. Uh, and so there's something going on here. And so what's going on there, of course, is our old friend, the bank heart tear, uh, left over from a couple questions ago. Uh, and we see that that bank heart tear uh, is a very common entity. It's the, basically the essential lesion. So there was a big argument back when I was a resident about what the essential lesion is, and whether it was the labrum or the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex. Well, the argument's passe because it's both. You see, because the anterior band attaches to the labrum, which attaches to the glenoid. So when you have a bank heart tear, you tear both the labrum and the anterior band. So there's the essential lesion, and that's what we try to fix arthroscopically. When the arm's abducted and externally rotated, it can be painful. The apprehension sign, which is associated with this, uh, you can push on it and make them feel better. That's called the relocation sign. Uh, and you can do a load and shift sign. All of these uh, go along with that finding uh, and with the patient that has uh, a uh, labral tear, anterior instability, and therefore they have pain in abduction external rotation, uh, which is the apprehension position. Easy. Now, shoulder imaging. The question here is, uh, we're looking for a Hill-Sachs defect. Which of the following views 
is helpful in identifying a Hill Sachs defect. Well, if you know what a Hill Sachs defect is, you can simply look at these pictures and which see which one shows it the best for you. Uh, and so is that a true AP? Is it a scapular Y? Uh, is it uh, this view? Uh, is it a Zanka view? Is it an axillary view? Axillary view, very helpful for posterior instability. But let's revisit this view. And that is the striker notch view. It's taken in this position. Here's a recognized uh, uh, we, uh, view we see. And this shows this hatchet-shaped defect, which occurs from the shoulder dislocating and banging in to the back of the glenoid, the front of the glenoid, uh, just like the uh, same injury that happens in the ACL, only with a bigger defect. And it causes this giant hill sacs defect. Now, this can cause other problems itself, uh, which uh, can sometimes cause an engaging hill sacs defect, meaning that this uh, will engage with the rim of the glenoid here and cause recurrent shoulder instability. So this is big enough, you may have to do something else to that as well, including free ensemblage or bone grafts or a variety of other uh, options. However, for now, recognize striker notch, Hill Sachs defects. If you have a bony bank part, you should get a West Point view and other views for other etiologies. Now, the one little tiny caveat I'll add here is that besides the striker notch, what at least the uh, OIT likes to ask about is an AP in internal rotation. So that's another way to view a Hill Sachs defect is an AP in internal rotation. So with that in mind, uh, we look at these uh, options. There was no AP in internal rotation, uh, and therefore the only answer uh, was the striker notch, which was number three. Okay, let's move on. Exercise science. Again, Derek's uh, fantastic graphs. He's done a lot of work with his and a team to, to characterize these injuries. I certainly applaud all the works. I'm a big ortho bullets fan, and I think you'll see me on there if you uh, will join ortho bullets and, and look for my comments. Hopefully they're helpful. All right, sports medical. Dynamic exercise training can increase the cardiac output. Which of the following mechanism? Well, here's a kicker for us. Not much of us are very good at the heart, uh, and uh, that's uh, a problem, and therefore we've got to memorize a few things. Uh, so I think we can memorize one simple equation in this uh, paradigm. And that is, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. So in athletes, the heart rate actually goes down. And therefore, if we want to have more cardio, cardiac output, we've got to really increase the stroke volume. And so we need dynamic exercise to increase the stroke volume. Uh, here, uh, demonstrating these increase in stroke volume here also. Uh, and so, fortunately, the athletic heart syndrome, which is not a problem, it's a good thing to have, uh, with increased training, you increase the chamber size and the left ventricular wall thickness to allow you to have increased stroke volume. Now, this is not the same as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That is a pathologic thickening. This is a physiologic thickening. It's a good thing. Uh, and so uh, recognize the simple equation. Go back to the test question. And here we have increased stroke volume. Uh, certainly not increased heart rate because athletes have bradycardia. Uh, and the other questions don't make a lot of sense because we're talking about the heart. Next question. Iontophoresis. Well, this is a modality, including ultrasound and ice and cold treatments and others, uh, we use commonly, and uh, especially in the training room. And so the question is, uh, what is uh, the uh, mechanism for this to work? And what does it do? Well, iontophoresis basically takes medicine and puts it into through the skin uh, through electrical current. And so the key here is electrical current. Electrical current drives charged molecules through the skin to deeper tissues. You can use steroids. You can use um, NSAIDs. You can use a variety of other uh, medications, uh, iontophoresis. 
you don't have to necessarily believe in this. You just have to know the answer to the questions. And so recognize what that means. Uh, recognize uh, ice therapy decreases inflammation. Uh, ultrasound commonly used also. E-STEM for quads. And so know what these mean because they're commonly used in the training room and they can be asked on uh, examinations. So therefore, back to our question, we use transcutaneous deliverer of medication with lactocurrent, and that's the definition of iontophoresis. And then we're back to our old friend here, uh, Mr. Uh, Open Chain. Uh, Mr. Open Chain, uh, uh, really, you don't even need to worry about these first three answers uh, because the last two basically make the first three obsolete. Uh, and therefore, you have a 50-50 chance. And if you know that F open chain uh, basically allows you to kick off without any opposed opposition as opposed to closed chain where your foot is fixed to something, uh, and that's the answer to that question. Uh, and so, uh, well, I don't know what happened to our questions. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the issue here really involves the fact that uh, this is a closed chain as opposed to an open chain exercise. Uh, and uh, you know the definitions for the other issues, uh, and they're all based upon uh, Latin. Uh, and so uh, I recognize that uh, isometric means there is a, a constant uh, resistance, uh, no change in length. Uh, Isoinertial vari variable resistance. Isotonic constant resistance. Isokinetic constant velocity or speed. Uh, and then we've already talked about plyometrics, rapiding, shortening, uh, and uh, jump training, etc. So the answer here wasn't so much these definitions, even though it's important to know those. The answer here was simply between closed and open chain. Uh, and uh, we go back to our test question, uh, and the answer was open chain. Uh, when you see these two options and the other three, just, just focus on the simple answer, and that, that's easy to answer that. Okay, moving on. We're moving on to uh, posterior shoulder instability. So, posterior shoulder instability. 26-year-old uh, uh, offensive lineman, shoulder pain, uh, can't block, has a positive jerk test. Uh, that's not, as I told my fellows, that's not based upon the examiner, at least when I'm doing the test, uh, and uh, also a positive chem test. So, jerk, chem, what does that mean? Uh, well, uh, we'll go over that now. Jerk test. Uh, posterior uh, axial pressure on the shoulder. Uh, and as you move the arm uh, uh, in this direction, it relocates. And so the interesting thing is that it, it actually makes more of a jerk when it relocates uh, as you uh, move the arm into uh, uh, abduction, and it relocates, backs, it jerks back in. And that's why that's called a jerk test if you have posterior shoulder instability. Note the axillary force here, the, uh, the axial force as you push it back, uh, and then it, as you abduct the arm, it jerks back in. Chem test is similar, just in a different degree of flexion, uh, and so both those tests are associated with closed, uh, with uh, posterior shoulder instability, often with posterior subluxation. Now, recognize it's a different, different animal when you have a locked uh, posterior shoulder dislocation. Uh, this is a different question that's often asked also, and that is the patient comes in, he's older, he uh, had electrical shock, fell off a ladder, uh, cannot externally rotate his shoulder. That's because he's got a locked posterior shoulder dislocation. That patient needs to be reduced uh, and then um, uh, placed in a, uh, uh, a gunslinger type brace. That patient also will appear because the ER knuckleheads don't know how to do an axillary lateral radiograph. So that's the question there. That's a very, very, very common question, is the axillary lateral radiograph in this setting. This setting, more for our football linemen, the uh, axillary lateral radiograph and the uh, electrical uh, 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 stimulation that dislocates, same etiology, different uh, question. So for this one, Posterior labral tear uh, is associated with those two tests, jerk and chem. Now, next question. Uh, a uh, diabetic female uh, has uh, pain uh, 
uh, and uh, she is in the other category. You see this picture here and you see only one view. Whenever you only see one view on the radiograph, look carefully at that and ask why they didn't give you another view. This is not the best example of this, but this is the so-called light bulb sign. And hopefully a light bulb will go off on your own head when you see a light bulb sign because that suggests that you have a posterior shoulder dislocation. Now this doesn't characterize it well, but there's often also a vacant glenoid sign where there's a big space here. Doesn't show up well here. But again, this is the other animal we're talking about. Traumatic posterior instability, fixed, adducted, internally rotated, seizures and shocks, got to get an axillary lateral radiograph. This question is asked like crazy. You will see this. There's not a question of whether you'll see it. It's when you'll see it on your examination. And so here we see this, this posterior subluxation, dislocation, uh, causes a reverse hill sex, often can be very big, uh, and the key answer is always axillary lateral radiograph. So going back to our question here, the answer is obtain further radiographic studies, and of course that is axillary lateral radiograph. Okay, now let's move on to the next topic, which is reverse total shoulder. Now it's interesting that this is now number six, because uh, a few years ago they were afraid to ask questions about this. Uh, they're not so afraid to ask them nowadays because it's becoming more and more popular. Uh, and so pay attention to this. The classic question, of course, involves an older patient uh, with uh, cuff arthropathy. But before we go to that, superior placement of the base plate during reverse arthroplasty can cause a complication. The boards and the OITE love complications. And so if you know what complications occur, that will ask often answer a lot of questions in and of themselves. So we know that if you place that blaze plate too high in the early uh, reverses, and the early reverses had failure rates of up to 50%, my gosh, how did it ever survive, uh, will cause inferior notching. And in fact, this notching can be graded based upon this classification scheme, one, two, three, and four. And this is a, from a superior placement. Now we know to place it more inferior and tilt it so this doesn't happen. Reverse shoulders popularized in Europe. Now they're in use in the US. We use them for rotator cuff arthropathy. But here's another question. You have to have an adequate deltoid and a reasonable bone stock of the acromion. You'll see this again. Uh, and so what it does, it movers, moves the uh, 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 moment arm if you will, more laterally, which allows the deltoid to function uh, as an abductor. The complications, as emphasized in this question, notching. And that's from superior placement of the base plate. You can also have loosening, instability, infections. There's huge uh, open uh, spaces here with this. Uh, and so this is a technically difficult procedure. Lots of complications because of that. The old boys on the ABOS love to ask about new procedures with complications. You'll expect to see this on your exam. So the answer there is scapular notching. So move on. 79-year-old uh, male, long-standing pain, uh, has deltoid wasting. Uh-oh, deltoid wasting. Remember we just talked about that. Uh, and uh, he's got potentially a high riding shoulder. He's got clearly rotator cuff arthropathy. Here's that back the glenoid. I bet the Gutelier uh, system shows some major fat in that thing. And what are we going to do about that? Well, what you don't do is reverse because the reverse is contraindicated in patient that doesn't have adequate deltoid. Uh, and uh, we just went through this slide and uh, recognize that uh, uh, the center rotation is placed medially, uh, but the entire apparatus is more lateral, uh, which allows the deltoid uh, to function as a uh, cuff muscle. So uh, if I misspoke there, the center rotation is medial, uh, but the whole moment arm uh, is uh, 
force times distance, recall that from engineering. And so uh, back to our original question. Uh, the answer is number three. He is not a candidate reverse because he has deltoid function. That's one of the key caveats uh, to have uh, a reverse shoulder as a candidate. Now, back to the knee and the posterior lateral corner, which is one of my favorite topics. Okay, posterior lateral corner. Uh, knee pain and stability uh, on physical exam, ACL, PCL intact. However, he has posterior lateral corner. Well, obviously, they missed this the first time around. Now, you can avoid this problem by not missing this in the first place, and that's what I've been trying to emphasize to my residents for the last 12 years uh, at UVA, and we're getting a lot better at it. Uh, so I encourage you to look at the most recent uh, uh, core uh, series on multiple ligaments. We have a nice article in there about avoiding missing posterior lateral corner injuries. In the meantime, uh, recognize that uh, posterior lateral corner injuries uh, require you to recognize them. If they're chronic, you need to consider about alignment. Uh, and therefore, uh, the uh, center uh, of uh, the, the alignment mechanical axis is an important consideration in a chronic posterior lateral corner injured knee. And it's and critical. It's the first thing that's fixed. And so, again, I've got to give credit to my Canadian colleagues uh, who have emphasized this over the years. And to their credit, they're right. If you don't fix the alignment, you're going to have a problem. You cannot fix soft tissue posterior lateral corner injuries without first fixing the alignment. So, uh, you somebody with a varus knee has mechanical uh, thrust, then get this film and then figure out where the alignment is and then uh, fix that first. Now, you can do it simultaneously if you have to, but you still have to fix the osteotomy first. And so here the answer is, get a long leg cassette, uh, hip to ankle. We like to get bilateral legs, hip to ankle, measure the alignment, compare side to side, and then help you with your preoperative planning. Now, another posterior corner injury. What is this about? Well, this is the dial test, and that's what we're going to ask here. Uh, we have an injury examination. We have this um, uh, external rotation asymmetry. Okay. So, External rotation asymmetry is a very common problem that's asked on board exams. By the way, this is the side of the injury. So uh, the key here is with you have an external rotation asymmetry uh, at 30 degrees, then you have an isolated posterior lateral corner. Now, in my experience, that means you have a posterior lateral corner and an ACL most often. But the question is, if you have it both at 30 and 90, it means you have a combined posterior lateral corner and PCL. So these two go hand in hand in 30 and 90. Do it both 30 degrees knee flexion and 90 degrees knee flexion to confirm uh, that you have uh, uh, a posterior lateral corner injury. Uh, and this means 15 degrees or so of asymmetry. Now, uh, this particular question is not really emphasizing this, but you will see that concept uh, on your exam. I guarantee it. You'll see it. So know that concept as well. This particular question is asking about anatomy. Now, what's interesting is most often the anatomy that's asked is about this relationship up here uh, on the femur. You see the LCL. Well, the prod likes to call this the fibular collateral ligament, but I have issue with that. But anyway, FCL, LCL inserts here, and the popliteus inserts here. Note this relationship. The popliteus is medial or deep to the LCL. It is distal to the LCL insertion, and it is anterior to the LCL insertion. In fact, Lepron has told us it's 18.5 millimeters between these two. So memorize this concept. Now. This test question is asking down here. Note the biceps. The biceps inserts here posterior to where the LCL inserts. The LCL inserts quite anterior on the fibula, and there's a lot of classic drawings that are actually wrong. So recognize this relationship because that's what this question is asking. But don't forget this relationship, which is more commonly asked. And therefore, the answer number three, biceps inserts posterior to the LCL in the fibular head. Now, you know that some of these questions is a long stretch from the clinical scenario they give you 
uh, to the question they're asking. But that's kind of the format for these exams, so don't be thrown off by that. All right, let's move on. Shoulder, total shoulders. Total shoulders, uh, here we see uh, significant uh, uh, arthrosis, uh, crepitus, right, and uh, they have these problems here. Uh, and so what do you do about advanced shoulder arthritis? Well, uh, you do a total shoulder, except if you have rotator cuff arthropathy, because you'll rock out that glenoid, deltoid dysfunction. If you have deltoid dysfunction, you have basically only options of fusion. Infection, uh, bad bone stock, palsies, etc. Back to our original question. Uh, the answer is, for this question, total shoulder. Easy. Easy. Next question. Uh, rehab phase, total shoulders. In fact, any rehab with a shoulder, any rehab with a shoulder, uh, you want to uh, uh, protect any open shoulder. You want to protect the subscap. Uh, and that's the reason for that is we've already discussed. We, we saw that in a previous test questions. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, this subscap repair is a critical step. And early physical therapy should protect this repair with no active internal rotation or external rotation past 30. Subscap, you take this down with a classic open approach. I suspect many of you have never seen this for shoulder instability. We, and uh, you may increasingly see it less with shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, but this is the classic approach. This is the classic problem. This is the classic issue. You have uh, increased external rotation. You have the lift off sign. So you can see the possibility for a multiple, multiple tier question, which they love to ask. So know it. Uh, and know these other issues we've already discussed. So the answer is protect the subscap. Protect the subscap. Next, PCL, another one of my favorite topics. All right, PCL, uh, here we have a kid uh, with an injury uh, and uh, has recurrent problems, uh, uh, has uh, a posterior drawer test and a posterior dial test at both 30 and 90. Okay? And uh, the question is, what do you do about this? Well, the problem is that he also has a alignment issue. We've already discussed this issue. They could have easily asked without an alignment problem, what, the, what do you do? And the answer then is uh, reconstruct both of them. Uh, by the way, uh, studies we have done have shown that if you have massive amounts of posterior displacement on stress radiographs, that is more than 20 millimeters, uh, JBGS three years ago, uh, then you will have a combined PCL posterior lateral corner injury. In those cases, uh, you need to do both. Now, the question here is back to the alignment. And uh, it must have been the Canadians asking this question because they love to uh, hit us on this. And so back to the alignment issue, recognize you have to correct the alignment first uh, with these combined injuries. And then here we are back to our question. And the question is five. Uh, with an alignment deformity uh, because uh, this patient has a varus alignment and a varus thrust. We've emphasized this before. Those two problems require an osteotomy. Uh, if you didn't have those two things, leave that sentence out of there, then you need a PCL posterior lateral corner reconstruction. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, what do you do when you have a non-operative PCL tear? What exercise do you do? Well, let's think about that. That's not too hard. We want to pull the tibia anterior. What pulls the tibia anterior? Well, that would be the quadriceps. Uh, and therefore, quadriceps rehab is the key for early rehab. Pull the tibia forward. This muscle right here does that, quadriceps. And that's the whole uh, basis of the quad active test. Uh, and that's what you want to emphasize early in your rehab. So uh, with isolated PCL tears, there is no question that that is treated non-operatively. Isolated PCLs, non-operative, no question, every exam. Uh, and therefore, uh, that emphasizes quad rehab. The only exception is a combined injury uh, and a bony avulsion. And those need to be fixed with operations. The other question asked on this topic is the late arthritis. Because increased contact pressures occur in the medial femoral condyle and patella, and that's where you get arthritis late. So, that means the answer then is quad strengthening for non-operative management 
of PCL injuries. So now uh, we have a few minutes potentially to ask some questions because we finished a little bit early. Uh, we're more than halfway through this and, and uh, I congratulate you for hanging in there. We're, uh, uh, I've been seeing a little bit of the chat room without trying to be too distracted uh, and I hope that, uh, that uh, everybody got something out of that and I'm happy to ask some, answer some questions. Mark, thanks for that. That was uh, terrific. Um, there's been a couple of questions and I think just a couple of my own observations as well. What would you say in the exam where they really like to hammer home a uh, physical exam, what are the need to know tests in sports medicine for those of us who aren't uh, sports medicine inclined? What do you really need to know the description of and how it influences management? Yeah, well, I certainly wouldn't include yourself in that group there, Stephen. Uh, the, the key exam, you should know at least one gold standard for each uh, injury. Uh, for the ACL, of course, is the Lachman. The key is it's done in 20 or 30 degrees of flexion, and the tibia is able to be passively moved anteriorly. The external rotation dial test is critical for posterior lateral core tests. It's asked all the time, and that's why I emphasize it here. The posterior drawer test for the PCL. Uh, sometimes uh, they like to ask the quad active test too, and that's why uh, I emphasize that. And sometimes they'll take that to a multi-tier question and have you recognize it starts subluxed or uh, uh, posteriorly subluxed, and then when you fire your quad, you pull it anterior. And so that's uh, a very commonly asked question as well. For shoulder problems, uh, you need to know the apprehension test. As we just saw, you need to know the, the Kim and the Jerk, at least what they represent. Uh, and you probably should recognize signs of systemic hyperlaxity uh, because they may try to fool you into operating upon someone uh, who is voluntary dislocator. Great. Uh, I think a couple of other things, speaking about shoulders, that seem to pop up again and again is the treatment of chronic posterior dislocations. So not necessarily the... A 25-year-old who has a seizure who comes into the ER has a missed dislocation and you just need to answer, obtain an axillary lateral. But uh, let's say you have the 25-year-old guy who uh, fell off his bicycle, uh, had a chronic posterior shoulder dislocation, was referred to your office uh, eight months later and has says, Doc, I just have this really hard time. I just can't get it out here anymore and you get an axillary lateral and sure enough he's really out the back. How are you treating a chronic posterior dislocation in the young and in the old? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the, the, the key here is the difference between acute and chronic actually is at three months, amazingly three months, but that's really where it is. And so within three months you can probably get it reduced even with an open reduction. Uh, the problem is after that it's exceedingly difficult to reduce even open. And the bigger problem that presents is the reverse hill sax defect, which causes a giant uh, problem uh, which needs to be addressed either most often with a shoulder replacement if it's very large, uh, or uh, you can sometimes transfer uh, a, um, a, uh, a, a allograft or bone graft in there. there there's described a, uh, a McLaughlin technique where you put the subscap in there. The near modification of the, of the McLaughlin technique involves a piece of bone with a subscap, but most often in the chronic, you're probably looking at uh, either a salvage procedure with a giant bone graft uh, or in an older patient, uh, a hemiarthroplasty. Okay. Okay. Can we, would you mind, I think another thing that some of the people find a little bit difficult is going back to this slide. When to treat an AC or excuse me a PCL? When do you can you describe a little bit more detail what your management algorithm is for the patient with an isolated PCL, be it grade one, two, three? When do you treat them non-op? When do you do a ligament reconstruction? And when do you do a uh, osteotomy? Okay. What's more important is not the way I treat them. It's what what happens. Uh, what's tested, and this is what you have to know. Isolated PCL, no matter what they call it on the boards, one, two, or three, uh, and, and I have some objections with the way they call it, but if they make it clear that it's isolated, they don't have a dial, etc. Isolated PCL, without question, is always, always treated non-operatively on any exam you'll have. 
uh, exception of a bony avulsion. Now, uh, combined injuries uh, means you have a massive uh, posterior drawer and uh, stress radiographs with 20 millimeters of side-to-side -side difference. That's a combined PCL and posterior lateral corner injury. Those always need surgery. Now, um, the other issue is that uh, with osteotomies, if you have a varus knee, uh, and particularly with a thrust, and that exam question we saw had both, then you need to get alignment films and figure out whether or not you need to do an osteotomy. And here, an opening wedge osteotomy is the treatment of choice. The board guys are pretty conservative, and therefore they would, you're, you should err on just answering with osteotomy and not trying to do something heroic like doing both osteotomy uh, and soft tissue procedures. So what I do doesn't make any difference. What you have to know is what those answers are. And speaking about that, I think one thing that I've only very recently got a better understanding of is you mentioned the uh, slope change in an osteotomy. And I think that that's one area that people have some difficulty. Can you discuss how you would change the slope, whether you would increase the slope or decrease the slope in a patient who has an ACL deficient knee versus a PCL deficient knee and sort of what the thinking is behind those two things? How ironic is it that somebody from the Fowler Sports Medicine Clinic is asking me about sagittal alignment with osteotomies? However, in deference to your mentors, uh, I'll try to explain as best I can. Uh, sagittal alignment has become an increasing recognition uh, in doing osteotomies, uh, uh, particularly uh, opening wedge osteotomies, uh, valgus producing osteotomy for various needs. Uh, and so the bottom line is you can increase the slope by putting that wedge more anteriorly. It increases the slope. And that's great for PCL deficient knees. Uh, if you have an, a chronic ACL deficiency, you probably want to put uh, the uh, slope uh, less. And therefore, you put the, the uh, osteotomy, the wedge, more posteriorly. Now, in reality, uh, it's so simple to do an ACL. I usually do those combined at the same time. So if you want to maintain uh, the current slope on the tibia, and this is an important concept that Frank Noyes has emphasized, uh, not from Canada, by the way, uh, is that if you want to maintain the slope, you simply have twice as much opening in the back than you do in the front. So if your osteotomy, when you're done, you're putting, you have a bigger gap in the front than the back, I hope you're doing it on purpose, or else you have a problem. All right, and enough osteotomy talk. Um, let's get back to a multi-ligament uh, knee, if you wouldn't mind. In a patient who comes in with a, we have a question here from Scott. In a patient who has an ACL and PCL combined multi-ligament injury, uh, what's the uh, accepted uh, management? Is it uh, multi-ligament PCL and ACL reconstruction at this point? Is it ACL and see how the PCL does? What are what is the current thinking? Well, there's a lot of controversy here, and whenever there's controversy they probably won't really emphasize this on the exam. Uh, the only issue with timing for this is that if you have corner injuries, you probably need to address them within the first 10 to 14 days, otherwise it becomes a giant scar ball. Uh, what I like to do is both ligaments, but again, what I like to do doesn't show up in the test. Uh, and so some one group of people suggest you should do the PCL early to establish uh, the, uh, the normal alignment and the, restore the central axis. Another group says you can delay that. So I don't think that's commonly questioned. So I, I don't think that's a fair question. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mark. As always, that was uh, outstanding. And we're really looking forward to the three hours that you give at the Miller Review course uh, in a few weeks. Well, looking forward to it. And without further Let me give you a shout out. Oh, I'm sorry. He's going to talk about uh, education at the course. And uh, he has uh, some really good insight on test-taking skills that you should look forward to. Oh, thanks, Mark. Um, so next, without further ado, Patrick McCullough from uh, Houston, although that's not where he is now with those fancy curtains behind him. Um, he will be uh, discussing uh, the next part of the uh, exam, and uh, hopefully he gives us some uh, excellent insights. So.
Patrick, I'm sorry. Can I interrupt you for a second? We're just having a technical issue here uh, with your uh, sound. You're really quiet for uh, some reason at this point. Can you uh, either speak up or put your uh, mic volume? So if you go... Sure, I just turned it up. Does that sound better? Yes, I think that sounds uh, better. Uh, can everyone uh, hear that now, guys? Anybody in the chat want to respond, please? Is that better? Patrick, can you just give a couple little more audio? Sure. Um, so I'll get going with this question. It looks like the volume sounds better. So um, the suprascapular neuropathy, they want to know if you can recognize it when you see it and if you can figure out where it's being compressed. In the stem, they give you a 25-year-old volleyball player. When you see volleyball players, they can get a traction injury to the suprascapular nerve. So whenever you see that, you should already be thinking about it. Volleyball players and other overhead athletes can also get superior labral tears or slap tears. And those are associated with cysts that can affect the suprascapular nerve. So if we look at this stem, and this person has weakness on external rotation and atrophy below the scapular spine, uh, and a positive O'Brien's test or active compression test, which can be indicative of a superior labral tear. So when we look at this, they like to ask you about where it's compressed. So here's the suprascapular nerve, and here it is in the suprascapular notch. And so th this can get compressed by the transverse ligament here. If it does, you're going to get atrophy of both the supraspinatus above the spine as well as the infraspinatus below the spine. However, if it gets compressed here uh, at the spinoglenoid notch, well then you're only going to get uh, atrophy of the infraspinatus because it's already given its nerve supply to the supraspinatus. Okay? So when we look at the question again, we had a volleyball player with a possible slap tear and atrophy below the scapular spine. You're going to think about a superior labral tear and a uh, cyst in the spinal glenoid notch. Here's another question which is very similar. If you notice, they gave you another volleyball player. This person has a history of shoulder pain and weakness. Um, and the clinical photograph here shows the back of the shoulder. And the back of the shoulder, here's the spine of the scapula. And below that, you can see atrophy below the spine, but not above. They also give you an MRI. And this is a sagittal oblique MRI with anterior over here and posterior back here. So when we look at it, here's the subscapularis, here's the supraspinatus, looks healthy to me, here's the spine of the scapula, and just below the spine we see fatty atrophy and we see edema within the muscle belly of what is the infraspinatus. Okay. So if we know the supraspinatus is fine and the infraspinatus is not, again, that's spinoglenoid notch. Because we reviewed this, this slide already. If it's being compressed here, you're going to get the atrophy here and infraspinatus only. The EMG may, is diagnostic of this, but the MRI may be fairly normal. Again, here's the answer, spinoglenoid notch. When we move on, we can move on to the elbow, to medial ulnar collateral ligament injuries. And they like to ask you about the anatomy in particular. So here we have a 22-year-old college baseball pitcher. So pitchers, you're already thinking elbow. If they say college pitcher with a medial ulnar collateral ligament rupture in his throwing elbow, he's going to need surgery for that. Anatomic restoration. Um, will give you uh, the best function and so you need to know where to put it and what you need to know whenever they ask questions about the medial ulnar collateral ligament is that they always want to ask about the anterior uh, bundle okay so if you go with anterior bundle as the correct answer um, it doesn't it almost doesn't matter what the question is you, you'll get almost all of them right okay so here's the anterior bundle here when we do a a so-called Tommy John reconstruction. Um, they might ask you uh, where does it in, where does it originate, and it's anteriorly, inferiorly, on the medial epicondyle. Where does it insert? It inserts on the sublime tubercle, and we're doing the reconstruction really of just the anterior bundle. 
So anterior bundle is the isometric one. That's the one that we want to fix. Good. Next question. Medial elbow in a pediatric patient. Okay, so this is a 10-year-old little league pitcher with medial elbow pain. It ought to make you think about little league elbow. Um, he has decreased throwing effectiveness, decreased distance and control. What is the pathogenesis of the condition? Well, you have to know what the condition is first, and then you can get to the pathogenesis. So little league elbow is another valgus overuse injury where you get stress to the medial apophysis which is the growth plate at the medial epicondyle. Stress in that area from uh, valgus and uh, overload by the flexor pronator mass can cause some uh, separation or inflammation uh, at that apophysis and that's called little league elbow. So when we look at the different choices here, uh, three is the correct answer. Repetitive contraction of the flexor pronator mass stresses the chondroosseous junction or the epiphysis leading to epiphysitis. Okay. Pathology. And in meniscal pathology, they like to ask different questions, um, but especially about treatment and complications. So, here they give you an 18-year-old football player who sustained a twisting injury to his knee a month ago and has continued medial-sided pain and what we call mechanical symptoms. They're giving you some MRI slices, so they're trying to get you to, to make the diagnosis based on that history and imaging. Okay. And then, once you've made the diagnosis, they ask what physical exam finding would classify. So when we look at these, we have a T1 image over here. It's fairly small on this, so it doesn't show up great, but hopefully when you took the test, it showed up better. And what we see is a high signal linear line that extends either to the superior or inferior articular surface, and that is uh, diagnostic uh, on the MRI for a meniscal tear. Okay. So when we look at meniscal tears, um, it's the most common uh, injury to the knee requiring surgery. Um, there's a high risk in ACL tears or in ACL deficient knees. MCL tear, uh, sorry, medial meniscus tears are more common than lateral meniscus tears. They sometimes ask uh, in the setting of an acute ACL, which is more common. And in that case, it's the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And that just dovetails nicely with what Mark showed you about where the bone bruises are. And you can imagine how that posterior horn of the lateral meniscus On exam, uh, joint line tenderness, which localizes to the medial or lateral joint line, and a positive McMurray's test will be indicative of a meniscal tear. So um, if they gave you joint line tenderness, that would be a good answer. Instead. They give you the McMurray's test and ask you to pull out that it's a painful pop when bringing the knee from a flexed position into extension while externally rotating the knee, which brings that posterior horn of the medial meniscus uh, into the compartment where it can, ge where it can generate symptoms. The next question also about meniscus. And for this one, they showed you a video. Now, video questions have gotten increasingly popular just over the last two years on the boards uh, and on the OITE. Um, if you've taken the test, you've seen the video already. The video doesn't run here on this, uh, on this webinar, but we can talk about it. When you look at the video, there's clearly a meniscal tear. And in order to get the question right, you first have to determine whether this is a medial meniscus or a lateral meniscus because that will eliminate some of your possible responses. So when we look at this picture, I can tell just by looking at it that this is going to be a medial meniscus. Okay? The medial meniscus takes up less of the surface area on the tibia than a lateral meniscus. Okay? Medial meniscus is C-shaped, where the lateral meniscus is, is almost round and it takes up most of the articular surface. So if we saw this meniscus extending 
over to here and curving in back into with the anterior horn in our view, we would be thinking lateral meniscus. At the very end of the video, they also panned towards the notch. And what you could see is that the ACL was arising um, from this side and going towards the other side. So the ACL uh, attaches on the lateral femoral condyle on the femur. And so when they showed you that, they were giving you a little tip off that this is in fact a medial meniscus. So when we look at them, is it a horizontal cleavage? Is it a parrot beak? Is it a displaced bucket handle? Well, when we look at the different meniscus tears, here's a graphic which shows these different things. A bucket handle tear is one just like the handle on the top of a bucket, which can be flipped from one side to the other. And in fact, that's what can happen is when this tear develops, if the fragment then flips forward like this, it can be displaced into the notch and cause a locked knee. They didn't show you a picture of that. They showed you a picture more like this, okay? where the probe came in and pulled that flap or parrot beak tear forward um, and that would allow you to get the correct answer which is a medial parrot beak type tear. Distal biceps tendon avulsions. Here if you notice the questions are more scattered. They like to ask different things but complications are certainly one of them. And we'll get to that in a second. They give you a 40-year-old man who was moving furniture and developed a pain in his anterior forearm or his antecubital fossa. He's got tenderness there. He has decreased strength on supination and elbow flexion. Okay, So from that stem, you should get the fact that he probably has a biceps tendon rupture. Okay, um, When they give you the MRI. The MRI in this case is just confirmative. Okay, You've already made the diagnosis of distal biceps tendon rupture. Um, on the MRI, they show you a distal biceps tendon rupture. Okay. Um, then they ask you sort of a, a, a little bit of an esoteric question based on that. His injury typically occurs in what portion of the tendon's distal insert? So, to review biceps tendon uh, avulsions, um, the several pictures here which uh, show the biceps tendon coming in to insert uh, down onto the radial tuberosity. Remember that that radial tuberosity is fairly posterior, okay? So it's posterior and medial. So this biceps tendon actually has to wrap around the radius. The answer is that partial tears often begin on the radial side um, and whether that's due to uh, microvascular supply and a watershed area or some people think that it may be due to in fact direct irritation of the tendon as it wraps around the radius um, that is the correct answer for this particular question. The other thing that they like to ask a lot is about nerve injuries. Okay, So the most common nerve injury with surgery for a distal biceps tendon is an injury to the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. Okay? Um, that is superficial in your anterior approach to the elbow. So it could be injured with either a one incision or the anterior part of a two incision repair. Um, the one thing that they uh, has gained increasing recognition is that with the one incision repair you don't have the opportunity necessarily to go and protect the posterior interosseous nerve. So for example, if you do a one incision repair with an endo button, well your guide pin that you use to pull the, uh, to pull the endo button uh, through the back side of the forearm could actually pierce the PIN or as the button flips it could in fact entrap the PIN. So there have been several papers on this recently, and I would say that you think of the lateral antibrachiocutaneous nerve first, and then if they're leading you to it with a one incision, remember the PIN. So back to our question, uh, which part? The radial part is this part that starts to fail first in a distal biceps tendon avulsion. Keller instability. 
They like to ask a lot about the diagnosis. So symptoms, imaging, that sort of thing is the most common thing they want to ask you about with patellar instability. Okay. Um, here we have a question with a 27-year-old football player who sustains an acute lateral patellar dislocation. What is the most likely site of injury on the seen on the MRI? So what they're asking you about is what gets injured and where. And if you know that with uh, patellar instability, the primary restraint is the MPFL, then you know they're looking for an MPFL injury. The MPFL can be torn off with a fragment of bone, but that's less common. Usually it's torn off as a soft tissue avulsion, and the most common site is on the femoral side. Okay, So femoral side, MPFL avulsion is number one, and they seem to like to ask this frequently. Um, we saw an, an image of a patellar dislocation on the MRI images when they were showing uh, bone bruises. And what you'll typically see is a significant bone bruise here on the medial facet of the patella and a corresponding one here over the lateral trochlea and lateral femoral condyle, depending on the degree of flexion at the time of the dislocation. The most common site they'll ask you for an articular cartilage problem, number one, medial facet of patella. So if we go back to our question, it's a football player, acute lateral patellar dislocation. We're thinking about an MPFL tear, and the most common is a soft tissue tear off of the femoral side. And that's number two. Multidirectional instability. So we already dealt with um, the traumatic unidirectional inst acute instabilities. And they also like to ask you about multidirectional instability. Multidirectional instability is defined as, um, as instability in two or more planes with one of them being inferior. So here they give you a college swimmer who complains of shoulder pain that increases after his workouts and when he increases his workout duration. He denies any trauma, so this is non-traumatic. He admits to popping his shoulders in and out voluntarily since the age of eight. It reveals bilateral anterior shoulder apprehension and relocation, so he's got some anterior instability, and it's bilateral. A positive jerk test indicating that he's got some posterior instability bilaterally and a two centimeter inferior sulcus. Okay, so these shoulders are loose in two or more planes with one of them in being inferior, so he's got multi-directional instability. Okay. Um, they give you some radiographs um, and uh, the MRI, um, and on these they're basically trying to get you to see um, that you can recognize that the interarticular space on this arthrogram MRI is fairly large or a capacious joint space and that can be uh, and we don't see uh, a lesion where the anterior labrum or posterior labrum are torn off. So when we look at multidirectional instability um, we think about the acronym of AMBRI so atraumatic which we have multidirectional bilateral the treatment should be rehab until the cows come home and if you ever have to do surgery an open surgery would be an inferior capsular shift, or an arthroscopic surgery would be a capsular imbrication. Um, on the MRI, you can see that capacious joint space particularly well on an arthrogram. Uh, we talked about the sulcus sign, and rehab, rehab, rehab is the way that you should be treating these patients. So the answer then is not these different kinds of surgical repairs but rather rotator cuff and periscapular muscle strengthening. Steroids and stimulants. Um, they want to ask you about the treatments and complications. So when Derek does this breakdown, what you can see um, is it's very helpful to know what the things are that they really ask about. 
treatments and complications with these are what they want to know. So, an athlete asks about performance enhancing substances. Which of the following side effects is more common with creatine than with testosterone? Okay. So, um, we know that a lot of these are common with testosterone. Which is more common with creatine? Well, here's a photograph of Mark Miller in the gym at UVA. And uh, I asked him what he was drinking, and he said, this is my creatine shake right here. I love it because it helps me to have explosive power uh, for short bursts, like a football lineman or a sprinter. Okay? Not for endurance, but it does show increased power for ex explosive bursts. But the one thing he told me that he didn't like about it is that it causes a lot of cramping. Okay? dehydration and of course if you get dehydrated uh, then you run the risk especially if you're practicing in hot weather of uh, kidney problems so our answer here hair loss testicular atrophy acne impotence all associated with testosterone but muscle cramping is the one that they want you to know about creatinine glenohumeral arthritis um, here with glenohumeral arthritis, um, they ask about uh, all the different aspects of it, um, and including um, the basic science of it and the treatment of it. So, in comparison to patients with osteoarthritis, patients with inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and others, who are undergoing shoulder arthroplasty are more likely to have which of the following? But when we look at glenohumeral arthritis in general, we'll start with osteoarthritis, okay? Uh, we're all familiar with a lot of osteoarthritis in, on the hip and knee surface. Those are weight-bearing joints, so they all tend to wear out uh, fast shoulders. And we know that the definition is joint space narrowing, osteophyte formation, subchondral sclerosis, right? These patients typically get contracted down and then they develop a posterior glenoid wear, which is another question they like to ask. Treatment is NSAIDs. Uh, there may be a role for arthroscopy and debridement, um, and then uh, uh, some form of arthroplasty. Okay? Um, when we talk about inflammatory arthritis, it's the same in the shoulder as it is in the hip. They tend to get fewer osteophytes, and they tend to get more medialization or centralized narrowing of that joint. So if we go back to our question, a large inferior head osteophyte, well that's really osteoarthritis. Posterior humeral head subluxation, again, more typical of osteoarthritis, as is sclerosis, posterior glenoid wear. The answer is medialization of the glenohumeral joint line. So just like in a hip, um, the same is true for inflammatory arthritis in a shoulder. Osteochondritis desiccans, or OCD, okay? Uh, treatment and complications is really what they want to ask you about, okay? Do a question. This is an 11-year-old boy who complains of four weeks of medial-sided pain that began while playing tennis. So activity-related medial-sided pain in a little 11-year-old guy. Um, Examination reveals reproduction of pain with internal rotation of the tibia during extension of the knee and relief of pain with tibial external rotation. If you know OCDs, then you'd know they've just described the Wilson sign for making the diagnosis of an OCD. A radiograph and MRI are shown in figures A and B. So on a lot of these tests, they give you ancillary information. If you're paying attention to the question stem, to the history that they're giving you, then oftentimes you can get the right answer and you use the imaging for confirmation. So when we look at this, we should be looking and saying, does he have an OCD? And in fact, we look at the medial femoral condyle and we see a little something funny there. We look at the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle on this T2 type MRI and we see some edema here and a little fragment of subchondral bone in a skeletally immature patient, which you can see. OCD, the juvenile form, 
has a better prognosis. So if you see someone who's skeletally immature with an OCD, think conservative management. They'll often give you several different operative treatments, and those are actually fairly controversial as to which one is the most appropriate treatment. But it's okay, you can bail out by picking the non-operative choice in a juvenile OCD, because when those growth plates are open, the blood supply is different and they have a better prognosis for healing. Where does it go? It goes to the medial femoral condyle way more often than anywhere else, and it's here on the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. Uh, when we talk about uh, and when we talk about surgical treatment of it, again, it's somewhat controversial. Some people recommend drilling. Um, some people recommend retrograde drilling behind the fragment. Others recommend uh, internal fixation, so putting in something like a compression screw or Herbert screw, whether metal or bioabsorbable. Um, but again, that gets a little bit controversial. So if we go to our question here, they give you arthroscopic fragment removal. Well, probably don't want to do that if we don't have to. How about an open reduction internal fixation? Okay, drilling, uh, hmm. none of those sound particularly good in a juvenile. So we've got either non-weight bearing for six to eight weeks, or we've got full weight bearing, but just not playing tennis. Well, the idea is you want to give this a really good chance of healing, so non-weight bearing for six to eight weeks is the correct answer. How about slap lesions? What is a slap lesion? Slap is another one of our sports acronyms that we like. For a superior labral tear, which extends from anterior in relation to the biceps uh, anchor. Um, the, it, there have been some studies that have shown that in guys who are taking the uh, oral part of the board, so part two of the boards, um, they've found that there have been a lot more superior labor repairs performed. Um, they're not sure if they like it, and they're going to ask you questions about it to make sure you understand what's going on. Here's a 26-year-old outfielder who undergoes arthroscopic repair of a right shoulder type 2 slap tear with two labral anchors. So one at 11 o'clock and one at one o'clock, basically front and back of the biceps tendon. Uh, the way they've described that it's done, there are other ways to do it as well. Post-operative rehabilitation for this slap should include which of the following? And then they give you a bunch of different options. Okay, um, And when we look at shoulder rehab in general, it's all fairly similar. So you'll all have different protocols that you'll develop or that you'll see with the people that you work with. But there are some basic tenets which apply and they want to make sure that you understand that. So just writing evaluate and treat on a physical therapy prescription is not adequate. Um, they want you to know that uh, they want you to be able to say what you actually want in physical therapy and to write it out. And what we often do in shoulder when we fix something is we want to do early motion, but we don't want to stress the tissues. So whether this is a superior labral tear or a rotator cuff tear, we typically want early motion, but we want that to be passive range of motion. After an initial protective phase, we then progress to active assisted motion. So passive motion is when the therapist raises the arm. Active assisted is when the patient raises the arm using their other arm as a helper. Or an, uh, or an aid such as pulleys, and then we progress to active range of motion. Passive to active assisted to active. Okay. Um, if we go to our question, the answer that they've given you, so they say immediate active full range of motion, no, probably not. Okay. Um, full time sling wear with no motion, no, that would probably lead to stiffness. Rotator cuff strengthening early, um, again, that's a little bit controversial, um, but limited passive motion for four weeks, then progressive active motion until eight weeks, followed by sports specifics. This is sort of cookbook rehab for shoulder, and that's your correct answer. Scapular winging. Um, there are only certain things that are testable 
um, on the boards and on the OIT. And the reason is that a lot of clinical areas are actually fairly controversial or rapidly evolving. One thing which does not evolve rapidly is anatomy. And so they'll often try to give you a clinical vignette or something along those lines. But what they're really getting at is do you know your anatomy? Okay. So here, a college swimmer develops medial winging of the scapula. So remember, medial winging is different than lateral winging. If the EMG and nerve conduction studies are abnormal, what nerve roots are most likely to be involved? So, two-step question, right? They want you first to know what causes medial winging, and once you know uh, what nerve is involved, then what nerve roots supply that nerve? So this is a fairly common way of asking an anatomy question in this two-step. In this picture here, you can see if this is the normal scapula on the left side, on the right side we've got medial winging where the, the, the inferior angle of the scapula is actually brought over medially. Why does this happen? This happens because the serratus anterior muscle um, starts on the anterior chest wall and it comes around and inserts on the deep surface of the scapula. And when that muscle is firing, it helps to hold that scapula forward in a protracted position, um, which allows for improved function. If you lose the function of the serratus anterior, or you lose the function of the nerve to that, the long thoracic nerve, you'll get medial winging. Okay? The long thoracic nerve then, what supplies that? It's C5, 6, 7, as you can see here on your drawing of your brachial plexus. Um, lateral winging, well that's when the lateral border goes, when the lower border or inferior angle of the scapula goes laterally. What causes this is a deficient trapezius muscle. And you have to remember um, that that's, uh, that's cranial nerve 11 for that, and that's less commonly tested. Okay, so if you want to get nerve root questions right, you know that there's going to be something related to the brachial plexus on the test, because there has been on every test you've ever taken in orthopedics. Um, when the test starts, um, find a place on your scratch pad that they give you to draw out the brachial plexus and so you don't have to think about it again for the rest of the test. And then all you do when you get to this question is you say, oh, uh, medial winging, that's serratus anterior, long thoracic, C5, 6, 7. we covered. Um, this one's actually about uh, thrower shoulder um, and they'll often ask about internal rotation. Um, one of the things that they'll ask about are the different um, uh, capsular structures. So when we think about the glenohumeral ligaments, they're actually just thickenings of the capsule. So um, besides the biceps tendon, which of the following structures also pass through the rotator interval? Okay. So they want you to know anatomy again. Rotator interval, they're going to give you one of them. They're going to give you the biceps tendon, and then you have to come up with the other ones. Okay. So when we look at the static stabilizers, the superior glenohumeral ligament, um, the middle glenohumeral, the inferior glenohumeral ligament, okay? Um, they'll ask you what position of the arm um, and what does it do in that position. So for example, uh, the superior glenohumeral ligament resists anterior translation with the elbow at the side. If they ask what resists anterior translation with the elbow out at 45 degrees of abduction, well, then the answer is um, middle glenohumeral. If they ask in full abduction, it's inferior glenohumeral. Okay, so they like to ask these different questions. The rotator interval, coracohumeral ligament, superior glenohumeral ligament and the biceps tendon and there's the answer to your question. So in the picture you can actually see a little thickening of the superior glenohumeral ligament here. Go to our question, they gave you biceps. What else goes through there? It's the coracohumeral ligament and the superior glenohumeral ligaments. GERD. GERD stands for glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. And that gets a lot of play now in uh, throwers um, and with sports medicine doctors. So here's a question where 
They give you a 22-year-old minor league baseball player, and he's being treated for shoulder pain with a rehab program. Figures A and B display specific rehab maneuvers that are critical to the treatment of this guy's shoulder pathology. So, if these are critical uh, maneuvers to help treat his pathology, what is his pathology? Well, you have to look at these pictures, and these pictures are actually from my office, and this is uh, my lead physical therapist here, and he's doing a prone internal rotation stretch to stretch the posterior capsule, and here the player is doing what's called a sleeper stretch, where he lies on his side to thereby stabilize the scapula, so that then when he pulls his arm into internal rotation, he gets a good scapular stretch, uh, sorry, a good posterior capsular stretch without his scapula lifting up off the body. So, let's see. Um, the thrower shoulder um, is one in which on the dominant side, they generally get increased external rotation on the dominant side, but they can lose some internal rotation on the other side. Uh, um, uh, they can lose some internal rotation on that side as well. So for example, on the dominant side, they may have 120 or 130 degrees of external rotation, but maybe they only have 40 degrees of internal rotation compared to 60 degrees of internal on the other side. So with a 20 degree difference, um, then we're worried about a glenohumeral internal rotation deficit or GERD. And the treatment for that is generally non-operative and it focuses on posterior capsular stretching with the sleeper stretch and the prone internal rotation stretch, which is demonstrated again here. So if we go to our question, um, they give you the different pathology. We already know that he's got a glenohumeral internal rotation deficit because he's doing sleeper stretch and prone inter internal rotation stretch. Tibial stress fractures. Okay, so here's a question of a 20-year-old distance runner. Okay, so whenever they're giving you a distance runner, a triathlon runner, someone who's involved in a repetitive overuse type of activity, you got to think about stress fractures, right? So proximal tibial pain six weeks ago. Initially, maybe it was only painful when they were running. Now it's painful even when they're walking. There's no real effusion. The radiographs are pretty normal. If the radiographs are, show a stress fracture, then there's a stress fracture. If the radiographs do not show a stress fracture, it doesn't mean anything. There could still be a stress fracture. So then you need ancillary studies. And here they've given you an MRI. And on the MRI, this is a T2 type of image. So everything's kind of grayed out. The bone marrow is sort of this charcoal gray color, except for throughout the proximal tibia where it's white, indicating a stress response. And if you can see a discrete fracture line, a stress fracture. So once you've made the diagnosis, two-step question, what is the appropriate treatment for it? Okay. So when we look at stress fractures, again, if we see a fracture on the x-ray, that's a problem. So this is what we call the dreaded black line. So this is a tension-sided stress fracture of the anterior tibial cortex. These are at-risk fractures. They tend to not heal particularly well, and they may eventually need treatment. Other at-risk fractures are ones that um, could potentially displace. But when we're talking about something here in the cancellous bone, we're not worried uh, about significant displacement, and we're not worried um, so much about the healing because the blood supply is so good in that area. What we really need to do is just get them off of that uh, off of that leg, right? So um, if they hurt when they're walking, then the answer is they need to be on pr protected weight-bearing with crutches until they don't hurt with walking. And then they can come off the crutches and still avoid running while we wait for continued healing. Teller tendon rupture. This is a 35-year-old man who slips on a patch of ice and hyperflexes his knee. He feels a pop uh, when he falls, and he's unable to bear weight. He's got a large effusion. So if you had a hyperflexion injury, felt a pop, large effusion, patellar tendon rupture, quad tendon rupture, 
ACL tear, these should all come to mind, right? And then they give you a radiograph, and then the, the game's already over, right? They give you this radiograph, and you see the patella way up here with a huge distance between the inferior pole and the tibial tubercle, and you know that this is a patellar tendon rupture, okay? So he undergoes repair of this injury with the standard surgical technique. Which of the active range of motion exercises most appropriate in the immediate post-operative period? Well, for the rehab, and this is a similar principle in most of sports medicine and in orthopedics, okay, um, we want to do things that are uh, closed chain early and open chain late. We want to do early motion, but we don't want to pull across the repair site. Right? So, in this case, heel slides where the foot is still supported on the, on the ground um, and they can do active flexion, so using their hamstrings to flex, but passive extension, so using gravity to bring it back out rather than pulling through their quad. So the answer here, heel slides. AC separations. Um, AC separations, we got a question of a 58-year-old man who falls off a bicycle four days ago and injures his non-dominant shoulder. The radiograph is shown below. Now, I'll give you that this is not a great radiograph, but they're giving you both sides. So this is a Zanka view, including both sides, so that you can see that on the right dominant side, the AC joint is perfectly aligned. So there is some variability here and some difference based on the angle of the x-ray. But if they give you this side being perfectly aligned, and you can see here this x-ray is kind of cut off, but that the, that the clavicle um, and the acromion are not perfectly aligned here. In fact, they look like they're off by uh, around 100%. Okay, So we're going to say that this is probably uh, a grade 3. Um, maybe uh, we think this is still a grade 2. It's probably not going to matter when we get to the uh, correct answer for the question. So when we look at AC separations, direct force, so falling on the, uh, directly on the point of the shoulder when you're trying to, uh, to catch a football, uh, flipping over your bicycle, landing on it, um, that's the common mechanism. The, treat, the classification is important but it's also not the best, okay? So um, what we know is that uh, ones and twos are always non-operative, okay? So a one, the x-ray looks normal, but they've got a little sprain here. On a two, you might see some widening, maybe 50%, something along those lines, okay? On a three, you've got a 100% step off, okay? And then this is where the classification gets a little funny. Then it goes four, five, and six. Four, five, and six are lumped together because they're all operatively treated. But four is not just a progression from three. It's actually posterior. Okay, So four is posterior. Five is way up. So over 300% up. So we can call that way superior or subcutaneous. And six is inferior, something I've never actually seen, where the end of the clavicle is actually buttonholed under the conjoined tendon, under the uh, coracoid, right? So ones and twos, always non-op. Four, five, six, always operative. Three is controversial, okay? Three, um, maybe uh, it's non-operative unless they're perhaps a laborer or an athlete and it's the dominant arm. And even that's kind of controversial. So one way to remember the four, five, and six is PSI. So the guy falls off his bicycle, and right on the on the tire of his bicycle, it's printed PSI all over that tire because it's posterior is four, superior or subcutaneous is five, and inferior is six. PSI. Back to our question, we said it looks like it might be a two could be a three. It's a non-dominant arm in a 58-year-old. What's the best treatment? Well, you know, there's there would be too much controversy 
about uh, whether to do a Weaver Dunn procedure or whether to do an anatomic CC ligament reconstruction. So what you know then is those answers can't be right. The answer must be non-operative treatment, sling, and early range of motion. Capsulitis. Adhesive capsulitis. You can you just have to know the typical patient who gets it. Who is it? It's a 42-year-old woman, so 40 to 60, female, with onset of shoulder pain. First it's painful, then it's painful and stiff. The trick is figuring it out um, if they present very early. But when they tell you that's painful and stiff already, um, then you know that you're dealing with some uh, adhesive capsulitis. Um, let's see, what treatment would you recommend early in adhesive capsulitis? Well, let's look at it. Uh, adhesive capsulitis, you know the shoulder is stiff when they lo lose both active and passive range of motion. So, if someone comes in and they can only lift their arm up to 90 degrees, well, Okay, that's their active range of motion, but I don't know if they can't go further because they're weak or they're stiff. So then I lift their arm for them and I check passive range of motion. Okay? In adhesive capsulitis, their loss of motion will be both active and passive, so they're stiff. They hurt at the end range of motion. Um, it's generally women. It's gen also associated with diabetes and hypothyroid. Um, if you get an MRI arthrogram, there can be loss of the axillary recess. And the treatment for this is non-operative with gentle stretching um, in the early phases. Okay, So you don't want to operate on these people early because, in fact, you can make them more stiff. So the answer here is reassurance with gentle stretching as symptoms allow. The only other non-operative choice that they gave you was immediate aggressive therapy. Um, I don't like the word aggressive therapy, and so whenever they put in things like always, never, aggressive, you should be a little bit uh, suspicious about that as an answer. Infectious disease. So this is, uh, I believe, our last question. Uh, which of the following dermatologic conditions is commonly seen in athletes and is most appropriately treated with mupirocin for small lesions and an IND and septra for larger lesions. Okay, so if you know about your sports dermatology, then you'll know that MRSA is the answer because they're giving you the treatment for MRSA. And so then you just have to look at the pictures and say, which one is MRSA? And MRSA um, looks like this. So there used to be uh, a poster in the in the Boston Children's Emergency Room and it said hey mom it's not a spider bite it's MRSA so these people often come in they say oh I think I got a 